When the Civil War ended, the politics and economics of America had changed drastically. This change led to the time period known as the Gilded Age. One event that happened during this age was the Reconstruction. Reconstruction began with Abraham Lincoln's second presidential term and continued into Andrew Johnson's presidency. The South was to be restored politically, economically, and physically. It also focused on integrating former slaves into society by adding the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Since the North had won the war, the country began adapting more advancements that would benefit the desires of Northerners. Industrialization, which was originally just in the North, became important to the country as a whole. Technological inventions such as electricity and the telephone helped to make communication and industrialization even better. There were some negative effects though. Many people did not regard the former slaves as being equal and this led to violence such as the Ku Klux Klan as well as segregation between the blacks and the whites. Also, there was the Panic of 1873 which began because of the economic scandals and corrupt bargains in the federal government. These changes in society helped to show a need for a new party, one with hopes to represent the popular beliefs of all of America. This new party was known as the People's Party or the Populist Party. Its origins began not too long after the Civil War and grew strength and supporters during the Gilded Age. It began with farmers who were fearful of losing their jobs. Since the advancements focused on increasing the industrialization, farmers became less needed. New machines were created which helped farming become completed quicker, but it also cut down on the amount of farmers needed to do the job. While these did help the economy increase, the old systems and old ways of labor began to die out. This is exactly what the farmers were afraid of. Many of the farmers did not have jobs anymore, and their financial stability was threatened. In the late 1870s and early 1880s, farmers began forming small committees that would hopefully protect them politically and financially. All of these committees joined together to form the Farmers Alliance, which was a nationally recognized organization that helped to publicize their problems and gain the government's support. Another group like this was the Knights of Labor. The Knights were workers who wanted more unity between all of the manufacturers. The Farmers Alliance and the Knights of Labor strive to represent the people who are being negatively affected by the new changes in society. So a new party, one like the People's Party, would have to step in and represent what they wanted as well as what the rest of America wanted. After the so-called People's Party was formed in St. Louis in 1892, Ignatius Donnelly of Minnesota drafted what is now commonly known as the Omaha Platform. Although many historians believe that the People's Party was started and formed in St. Louis, I don't think it would have gained any recognition if it weren't for the Omaha Platform. The platform set out core beliefs as well as a strong foundation for the party. I don't think that there would have been a People's Party if it weren't for Ignatius Donnelly. This document outlines the specific goals and beliefs of those who are part of the Populist Party. This platform displays the support of labor unions and workers rather than focusing on generating capital. This is shown through the expansion of civil services. Also, they supported the federal government taking control of and regulating transportation and communication, whether it be railroads, telegraphs, telephones, or postal systems. Although they supported federal powers in these aspects, they also wished for limited government intervention, as well as leaving most of the money in the hands of the people through circulation. This was the Free Silver Movement, which can also be defined as bimetallism. The Free Silver Movement constitutes the usage of both silver and gold as currency in a ratio, and in the Omaha platform, the ratio proposed was 16 silver to 1 gold. This also includes more money being in circulation, which gives more opportunity for common men to have stable financial situations. This is one of their strongest beliefs. It also protected Southerners and Westerners from high taxes and only allowed for an income tax. In order to appease the North, they made it so that the income tax would be graduated and increased over the years. The goal of the Populist Party, besides the platforms that they discussed at the Omaha Convention, was to replace the Democrats and gain the support from the farmers in the West and in the South. Even though they wanted to help the farmers, they wanted to have support from the industrial workers in the East. This party wanted to represent the popular desires of the country at the time. This meant that they represented some things that the North wanted, such as an increase in paper money production and enforcing the working day of eight hours. They also represented some things that the South and West wanted, such as no tax, exceeding income tax, and labor being protected by the government. Not only does this party represent all the sections of the U.S., but it also represented the rich and the poor, the workmen and the farmers. The intention of this party was to attract followers from all over America and represent their beliefs accordingly. 
This may have seemed like a party that would gain attention quickly, but in reality, it just contradicted itself. Although the original face of the People's Party was the great speaker Thomas E. Watson, it was another man who had a shot at becoming president in favor of the populists. William Jennings Bryan was a Democrat who gained the support of the populists. He was born on March 19, 1860 in Salem, Illinois. He practiced law in Jacksonville, Mississippi and then later moved to Lincoln, Nebraska where he was elected into Congress in 1890. His supporters considered him a successful orator and champion of liberal causes, while his enemies viewed him as overambitious. He influenced many important political issues of his time, such as having popular elections decide on senators, installing income taxes, and creating the Department of Labor Force. He also supported unusual causes, such as the prohibition and women's suffrage. He had joined a temperance movement when he was 12 years old and advocated women's rights in many of his speeches. These were causes that the people of the Populist Party supported as well. Bryan was best known for his leadership in the Free Silver Movement, which opposed the hard money policy of the Eastern bankers and the industrialists who favored the gold standard. The climax of his career came in the 1896 presidential campaign when he was nominated by populists and Democrats due to his similar beliefs. His Cross of Gold speech is said to have won him the nomination and is the highlight of his political career. William Jennings Bryan delivered a speech at the National Convention in Chicago on July 9th of 1896. In his speech, he emphasized the need for the free silver movement. As discussed earlier, this would have the government use both gold and silver as well as the paper currency. Bryan realized that there was a heavy reliance on gold, and in his speech, he emphasized how this tie should be cut and that silver should try to be incorporated as well. If they say bimetallism is good, but we cannot have it until some nation helps us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard because England has, let us restore bimetallism and then let England have bimetallism because the United States has. Ryan also discussed how the use of combined currencies would make it easier for the common man, such as farmers, to pay their debts as opposed to when there was only gold to pay with. Ryan was known to acknowledge the common man, saying that they are being taken advantage of by businesses and corporations. He aimed to reach his common people by using biblical allusions due to the fact that the Bible was widely known and understood by all ranges of people. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. His speech evidently reached his intended audience as he was nominated by the Democratic Party in the 1896 presidential campaign soon after his speech was delivered. The election of 1896 came down between Bryan and William McKinley. The popular vote was relatively close, having McKinley win by 5% of the votes. On the other hand, the Electoral College had him win by about 29% of the votes. McKinley supported gold being the main species as he thought silver would inflate the economy. He also believed in strong industrialization and banking. The morning of the voting, here is what some people had to say. Brian supports bimetallism, which will make it easier for me to pay off my loans and debts. He's got my vote. My husband and I want McKinley. Incorporated silver would ruin our economy. Brian will always get my vote if I ever got one. He is always a strong supporter of women's suffrage. If women had votes, we would all vote for him. This election was when the Populist Party started to rapidly come to its ultimate demise. The populist fused with the Democrats when they elected William Jennings Bryan. William McKinley, a Republican from Ohio, won the election after a rigorous campaign effort. The party soon lost its political significance. Many of their most prominent members retired or retreated to more stable and large parties that could uphold their beliefs. There was also a lack of motivation in the party for the people to join the cause. Their arguments often conflicted themselves, especially in regards to where the majority of the power should lie due to conflicting beliefs on federal power. It is also said that the widespread hostility towards banks, railroads, and anything that represents the upper class or elite was an aspect that led to the demise of the party. Although populism's death was rapid, the lasting effects of the political support of rural and urban cultures are said to have affected present-day labor and political systems for the better.